Hi, Rachel. I just made a random conversation. I'm going to share the link. Okay, that's good. It seems like it. Um, I was talking about this with you earlier. I was talking about how it seems easier to have a conversation when there's a conversation prompt, like someone asks a, a question or there's some sort of a, a debate going on and then you can create commentary or, or there's some context for starting a conversation. Yeah. It seems like that makes it easier. There's some kind of tension around some topic. At least that's how I get drawn in. But see, now yeah. we're having a conversation about a conversation. Well, it seems, well it seems, um, I don't know. It seems like we've tried to do these conversations in the past. And then it would seem like there would be this awkward thing where it's like, oh, okay, well, now we're in performance mode. And now we need to like think of a topic. But then that's not usually how we have a conversation. Yeah, it seems like we'll have a kind of energizing conversation where we're exploring something. There's these ideas, it gets very energized. And then I think, oh, let's record this. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we record it, it's like, okay, well now we have an audience. So it becomes different. But I'm convinced that we can have an audience and have the same kind of conversation. I think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that that's true. I think that what I'm realizing is that um, it's different talking to you when you're in the same room because I actually think that I feel your energy or something like that. It's like I feel your my pixels. Can't you just feel the energy? I'm giving you my energy right now. I'm sending like, no. you my love. Doesn't this no, feel actually, I don't. I don't actually feel like it's the same. And I was actually, I was actually thinking about that. I was thinking like, you know, there's a social media uh, trend of people connecting like virtually. Yeah. And I was wondering if that has an adverse reaction on people's health, just because of this phenomenon of when you're communicating via pixels on a screen, it's harder to have that sort of energy exchange or whatever it is that would be normal like and and what I mean by that like so so let me just like make it clear like I'm actually talking from um you know being having a scientific background so like I'm not just like talking like woo woo like you know like spiritual weird new age stuff I'm not talking about that I'm talking right, Rachel, about I, I don't want to interrupt you but I feel like right now I feel like we're in it we're in the conversation that we have because like now I'm itching to share something that is kind of woo woo, but I don't want to interrupt. So you, you continue. And then I'm going well, to share a woo woo thought. That's fine. You can, um, yeah. but it's, I'm, I'm actually, it's interesting because, you know, people, I think that this has to do with what we were going to talk about earlier, which has to do with authority structures and belief, because even the label woo woo, like it seems <laughs> like that is a shaming it's a sort of a label. It's a discrediting label, like yeah. that's baseless, that's woo woo, that's whatever. It, and it's it's actually a power move to label something like that, that is based upon an authority structure saying, I'm going to try to shame you out of your view because I'm gonna make it look like it's not very credible. Well, see, I thought you were saying that you have a scientific background as a way of gaining rapport with the audience saying, hey, you can trust me. I, I have some authority. No, I, I actually no. just want to give context of even what I'm thinking. So I think what I'm thinking is like, because I, uh, let me just completely be honest here. Like I would hear some um, people who would be more spiritual, like charismatic Christians or you know, even like new age people, and they would be talking about some of these things like, oh, like you have a spirit of whatever, you know, oh, there's the spirit of Elijah, or, you know, like, or you talk about, oh, like, there's this energy field of something, you know, and, and it's like, you know, it, it's sometimes not clear what people are talking about when they're saying those things, when they're using those terms. But when I am thinking with the scientific background, like, okay, here's something that I can kind of um, understand from my experience and the scientific lens as an interpretation. So like, um, 
if I imagine like my hand right here is made out of um, some sort of like particles, and then those particles are actually fundamentally made out of energy. And like, you know, you, one of the things that you learn is that a lot of the particles are mostly empty space anyway. And like, what does it even mean to be empty space versus energy versus a particle? Like all those distinctions start space? to get very blurry. What? And like, what is space? That was the first conversation we had when we met each other was what yeah. is space? Yeah. And so yeah. Um, when I'm talking about, like, I feel your energy, it's kind of like how, you know, if I close my eyes, like I can actually feel like this presence of like my hand, like, and I can feel that like, oh, like here's the, the hand. I feel that presence and um, it's internal to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, people talk about like, you know, they feel someone kind of walking into the room, they feel their presence or they feel someone looking at them and then they turn around and it's like someone staring at them or something. And it's like, I think that there's something real to that phenomenon. And you can even maybe, you know, perhaps scientists have already done this, like uh, linking it to quantum entanglement or, you know, like someone uh, used the term, like um, you send someone photons or you like, you know, basically like suck photons from them or something like, like, it's like, if you think about it in those sorts of terms, then suddenly it's more quantitative and it's something you can actually measure. Like, oh, like I can actually be, you know, like that story that our friend told us about someone being um, in front of the audience and holding up things on the side of them like this. And um, when the audience was all like giving them like affirmation and, and thoughts that were supporting, then it was easy for him to like hold those things up in his hands. But then um, as soon as uh, they changed their thoughts, like, oh, you are like such a bad, like your, your presentation is bad. Like, oh, like this is horrible. Like you're, you're doing a bad job. Like, it became like judgmental accusing thoughts. Then the, um, then the uh, person who was doing the demonstration came over and pushed the guy's arms down and it was like his, uh, his arms were weak and he's like, what in the world? Like, how did that happen? And so anyway, I'm just thinking about that in terms of like, if you actually have the ability to like send somebody positive energy to reinforce them or like suck energy away from them just through your intentions, like that might actually be, um, a, in a sense, a measurable phenomenon scientifically, if you want to talk about scientifically, like, it's not just some weird, like, woo-woo thing. Like, oh, oh it's just imaginary. You know, it's not just, like, imaginary. Like, yeah. that actually is something that could be real. Well, I remember she was also having the example of having three positive words about herself. And she felt like there was somebody who was antagonistic. And so she sent those words, like, in her mind to that person who was antagonistic. And then I think it was, like, a week later that person who was antagonistic said those three words about her, those positive words. And, you know, you can explain that in different ways, but I think that's related to what you're talking about. Like sort of this power of consciousness, like you can have, well, th this was the woo woo thing I was going to say is that I've kind of wondered if I can project like a positive energy into um, like if I'm writing something and then if I type like a Facebook post and if I have like a positive energy then that gets communicated through the to the post and people can feel that and it goes beyond the pixels themselves but then I, then I think well maybe the positive energy is explaining why I chose those words rather than other words so maybe there's different ways of explaining that but I think what you're saying and, I, and I'm actually curious about this is that if I'm not in the same room as you you're not feeling my energy in the same way and I, see, that's what I'm wondering because yeah, like because right now when I'm like looking at you, like I see the image of you, but it's different. Like I can tell you experientially, like I'm not feeling your presence. Okay, I'm let me do a test. Your presence. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sending you affection. Okay, I'm thinking about your beauty. I'm thinking about how much I like you. Wait, let, let me not do this conceptually. Let me really get my heart into this. So okay. Okay, I'm, I'm actually feeling some energy in my fingers now that's kind of tingling energy. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just like saying like, like, I love you. I think you're so cool. You're so special. Oh, I, I'm so excited. Like, how is it I got to marry you? I remember. 
I remember when I was at Notre Dame and I saw one of my friends and this was before I was dating you and, and he was dating you. And I remember seeing that guy, he was sitting in his office and he just didn't look very excited. I remember thinking, you know, if I was dating Rachel, because we had met, I would be way more excited than that guy is. And then look, it happened. Now I'm dating you. I'm not dating you. I dated you. We're married. Well, we can still date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm so no, relieved yeah, that we're already married because I, if I was acting this way, you know, how, how could you be impressed with me? But okay, so that and I'm sending you energy. Do, do you feel this energy or is it just different? Do I have to be in the room? I mean, there can be maybe possibly a little bit of a difference, but um, I don't know. It just There are those stories, right? Like where people will say, oh, I felt like somebody was thinking about me and then, then I got a phone call. Yeah. From that well, and I think that that's definitely true. I do think it's also a matter of degree. I mean, really, if you think about it, it's like, who was saying that, that if you actually can like understand the resonance of something at a particular location, and then you can measure the resonance of it at a different location, then you could actually figure out how to instantly transport it. If you could figure out how to change its resonance at a particular place instantly to the resonance of the other place, then you'd be able to instantly transport it. And it's like, actually, like, what if you could actually just by having a thought about a person, that's a way of actually bringing some part of you into resonance with them so that that's actually what it means to be in someone's presence. It's like be closer to someone's resonance. This so like when you are physically- idea, just to what? clarify, this is the, the quantum entanglement, like two particles get entangled. And you affect the one, it affects the other. I think I, I mean, remember what I don't I don't really know. I mean, um, there's a whole uh scientific discussion about quantum entanglement that I don't necessarily even want to get into because that's too technical right now. Um, but I feel like there's something that seems more on the intuitive level, like um, let's just say that um you know the computer science principle that you were using of um like if you the uh, similarity check, yeah if you check a pixel at a particular location probably the pixel close to it will be similar, similar in color yeah um and then you can use that to compress images like mm -hmm. the file size well i was just thinking like well what if you actually being close to me physically like in the same room like what if that actually does something in terms of like bringing us closer into resonance or providing the opportunity. Like maybe there's some part of us that's in a similar resonance because we're in a similar location. So then it actually makes it easier for us to experience each other's presence. Even when we're far away. What I was saying was when we were close together that it makes it easier for us to experience each other's presence than if we're far away. Yeah, sorry. Then, I was, I was, if I, I was just adding this idea that we get entangled when we're close together. Then okay. when we go far away, that's that's confusing. Okay. okay, so what I'm trying to say is that perhaps there's this other idea that there can be some part of you that gets into resonance with the other person, and then when you're far away, you maintain that resonance. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I that's fine. That's another consideration. But I was just thinking about why there might be a difference in what I'm feeling having you in the same room versus when you're like upstairs in a different room. Yeah. It's like when you're physically closer to me and then actually when I'm like seeing your real eye contact and like kind of like being in the same vicinity as your like real energy presence or something, then it seems like there's more opportunities for me to be able to connect with you to like you know, even if you talk about like mirror neurons and like getting in rapport, like there's more ways to get in rapport with you. Yeah. Right. It's like, I can see you, I can have mirror neurons. Like you can actually have a, an energy field around you that can interact with my energy field. And we can kind of like get into resonance. Like, you know, like there, there's um, perhaps even a resonance of the physical space that we're in. So then it's like, we can actually have way more opportunities to become like more in sync with each other so that then um it's very easy for me to like feel your presence you know what i'm saying yeah versus if you're far away 
maybe the idea is that you can still do something so that I feel your presence. Like for example, you could think in your mind, like these positive thoughts toward me and like really focus on me. And then like that I might detect that somehow, but I would say that it's like that requires more work, more focus. And then the effect might be more slight or like different or like let a fewer dimensions or something. And then I was thinking that if there was a way of actually making that experience of like, for example, if you in that part of the room over there are like thinking like, oh, like I just like Rachel, I just, you know, I'm thinking about Rachel, like that if you would like have enough of um, a skill or an ability to tune your resonance to me, that possibly that would even facilitate like your physical transportation, like to my location. Like, you know, your body, your body would actually like phase out of your location and come to my location. Like, I was just thinking about that. It, like, if you think about it in terms of like coming into resonance, um, then it's like, you can think about like, well, what dimension of resonance could you come into? Mm -hmm. Well, there's like a mental resonance and emotional resonance. Maybe you talk about like a telepathic resonance, right? And, and then it's like, okay, well, like, whatever this physical body is, like whether you even call it physical or not, I mean, is something physical, like that's mostly empty space that's made out of energy. Like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, our terminology is kind of strange, right? But it's like, if you talk about your body being distant and then you like being able to focus in the right way, just like you can easily focus in your mind, thinking about me, in your imagination and then you can think about like somebody else who's across the world right you can just change your thought and think about them in a certain sense you're dialing in a different resonance or a different picture in your mind in your imagination and then you imagine like that, that if you're able to upgrade your ability to tune into those things more specifically or like in a more multi-dimensional way yeah then you might actually be able to just you know instantly like relocate your presence, the holistic presence into a different place instantly. It's a way of like, turn, you know, you turn the channel on a TV or on a radio and it just instantly changes to a different channel. And you're getting different content. It's like, if you're able to um, really fine tune that process, maybe you could just like tune into a different location or tune into it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, well, no, it, it's interesting. I was actually just thinking here about what you were saying earlier about authority, because as you were describing this, I was thinking maybe it would be helpful to cite, the, there's this study that we've talked about where there was a married couple and they were separated into two different rooms. And then they looked at the brain of, was it the, the wife? Uh, they, they looked at the brain of, of one of them and then the partner had certain thoughts directed towards the person who was separated. And then they were able to find um, effects in the brain waves of the, of the receiver. There was the sender and the receiver. And there are studies like this. And I was just thinking about my instinct as you were describing all that, Rachel, to almost like point to some study and then I was kind of thinking, well, maybe the reason why I want to do that is because, again, it goes back to the authority. It's like, well, if there is, it's not just that there's empirical evidence. It's that there's an, an authority that's respected that says that there's empirical evidence, right? Because um, it seems like most people don't know the firsthand evidence. What they know is the, author, the, the report about the evidence. And I know this is maybe getting astray from what you were saying, but it's kind of on the meta level because I was just thinking like, well, how can we test that? Like, how can we investigate that? How can we experiment with consciousness affecting consciousness? And are you saying I can locate, relocate myself through coming into resonance with other parts of, of reality? Yeah, I think it's possible. I think you just have to figure out like, you know, what you're actually doing, what you're intending. I mean, if you really think that there are um, other ways of coming into, like if you really believe in quantum entanglement, then it seems like you really should be able to believe that, well, you can entangle more things or, or like- In principle, yeah. In principle, right? I mean, it's 
actually not strange. Like, it's not like a weird, you know, it's not like a weird theory. Like, it's actually just an extrapolation of what we already know, what's already mainstream. It's just that um, people, people like to control narratives. And so certain narratives are considered uh, normal and certain narratives are considered not normal. So um, that's, that's something that comes down with the authority structures, you know? Yeah. And that's what we were trying to talk about earlier, but. Well, it's also interesting thinking about like entanglement of like physical things that you might, I mean, what is a physical thing, but let's say particles versus like entanglement of emotional states. Because like, so for example, um, if you're in a state of sadness and I'm, if I'm in a state of anger, can, can your sadness come to my, to in, affect my state? You can make, you can convert my anger into sadness. Or if I go into a happy state, can that affect your state? Because the states get entangled. Yeah, I think so. I think you have lots of stories of people who they'll get this feeling like that there's something wrong with someone, you know, and it'll be before they get bad news that something happened to someone or like, you know, they'll, they'll just get a feeling about something or like what you said about someone having this feeling like, like suddenly they're thinking about someone and they're not even sure why, but then suddenly they get a phone call from them. And it's almost like, well, maybe they were picking that up because the person was thinking about them. And so the quantum entanglement was actually bringing that person to their mind because the person, you know, you imagine that they were thinking about you before they actually dialed your phone number, right? And they're thinking, oh, I should call Josh, you know? And then they go over and find their phone and then they, you know, type in your number and then they call you up and then you receive the phone call. But then it's like, well, before that they were thinking about you. So then that might explain why suddenly you had this idea of like, oh, like I'm thinking of my friend. And then suddenly they just call you, right? It could have been um, that that thought instead of being a coincidence, probably was indicating that there was some sort of entanglement, right? Yeah. Well, and then it's just interesting to think about how there's different ways of explaining that. I remember, you know, you, you mentioned having the sense of somebody's presence. And I remember there was this time when I was a child and my sister, Amy, she said she could always sense if I was looking at her. Uh, we were on vacation with my family and she was like, sleeping off the bed on the floor. She had like blankets off the floor. And then I was on the bed for somehow I was like on the bed and she was off on the floor. And so I would do these experiments where I would try to look at her, but like be perfectly quiet. And then as soon as my eye like turned to her, she would always, her eyes were closed. She'd always open up her eyes and she would say, she could feel that I was like looking at her. Mm -hmm. And that just didn't make any sense to me because I feel like I don't have that power. People always say, don't you know that feeling if you could just sense somebody coming into the room? And like, I don't, I don't seem to have that power. I, I've, I can't relate to that. Uh, if you're looking at me, I have no idea unless I see that you're looking at me. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'm deficient in that way, but, but maybe. <laughs> okay. So you're laughing at me, but I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe different people have different powers because I, I've thought about this in terms of senses. Uh, you know, we imagine different that people have, have different degrees of eyesight. Like some people can actually see clearly and some people have blurry eyesight. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you can exercise your powers. I think so. And by the way, I had read this article once where there was somebody saying with a Thor, uh, uh, an authoritative sort of like very judgmental attitude like yeah like nearsightedness and farsightedness are ca caused by you know the shape of your eye like you know like it's either like um constricted one direction or constricted the other direction and like you know there are these people who say that you can do eye exercises to help your vision but does it really make any sense to think that like doing eye exercises could change the sh shape of your eyeball <laughs> and i'm just like what in the world like so that's anyway, what i was told i mean I, that's what i always heard i, I know well i used to wear glasses i i've been healed of 
nearsightedness. It's just so weird because you think about like, okay, like, I mean, do this at your own risk, right? But when you're looking at something, like, I, just, I, I dare you, like, well, while you're looking at Me? something, so like, yeah, to like, just try to like, make your eyes get very blurry and then try to like, bring it back into focus, right? And you'll actually feel the muscles in your eye changing. Yeah. And, and it, you, if you are um, very uh, acutely aware you'll notice that your eyeball is actually changing shape a little bit because that's what the muscles are doing is they're like constricting and they're relaxing to change the um, focus of your eye. And so if you, if you're encouraged to exercise any other part of your body, why would, why would um, not exercising your eye muscles do anything? Like what, like, why would it be like, oh, like if you exercise your eye muscles, that's not going to do anything to help your vision to become clearer. Like that, that's just, that goes against everything that we have ever learned. I mean, it goes against your common sense. I think like, I mean, doesn't your like gut intuition say that there's something that you can do to like improve your body? Like, yeah, yeah but how can you trust your gut intuition if, if the authorities are telling you something else? Well, the same thing. Same thing, I think, with the brain, right? Like, um, I remember being told that this was many years ago, that your brain is um, static in a certain way, like it has certain capacities. I mean, it grows to a point, but then you can't like improve its kind of baseline intelligence. Then they came up with all this sort of, or if it gets damaged, there's certain things that can't heal. And I remember reading a Scientific America article, they talked about the uh, the, the changeability and what you can do and the mental exercises that you can do in your imagination and your mind that had, that can have physical impacts in, in the brain. So you can actually repair systems. Well, they used to say focus. that about your, um, your genes too, your genetic code. They used to say that, well, it's just, you know, certain things are just the way they are because genes. And then it's like, there's a whole branch of science coming out where they say, well, no, like you can definitely change your genes. Your genes are actually changing all the time. And especially like which gene is expressing. It's like, well, how, how does your genetic code determine which gene is expressing? And, um, you know, that's something where, you know, you start to get into the idea that your consciousness goes beyond your, um, genetic code. And then your consciousness can actually interact with your genetic code to co-create your physical expression. You know, you, you go with your genetic template and then your consciousness actually can help to express or repress certain genes. And that's all part of um, what it means. You know, like we, we've done these thought experiments before, of like what it would be like if, you know, you would enter into somebody else's body or, you know, like, like if you and I would like switch bodies, like we would like go into each other's bodies, like, like it would seem like there would be certain things that would change. Like there would be certain things that we would begin to change, like even just in our physical expressions. I mean, even if you think about it in terms of. You mean because like, my consciousness is different. So if I took your body, I would begin to yeah, make it but, inferior <laughs> to what it is. <laughs> that there would be different <laughs> things that we would choose to do. And then you can say, okay, well, if that's true on a very um, practical level, like, you know, maybe, um, maybe I would begin to, uh, you know, <laughs> trim my, to my body. toenails more often. <laughs> trim my toenails. <laughs> I cut my toenails this morning because they were ripping up our sheets. <laughs> See, this is the secret information. Any of you guys secret watching this, this is what you, you're not going to get this anywhere else. Rachel was complaining that my toenails were ripping up the sheets because <laughs> they needed to be cut. So I cut them this morning. Yeah. So anyway, if you think about that, that matrix of choices that you're making because of your consciousness, and then if my consciousness were put into your body, then I would have a different decision-making matrix that I would make if I were in your body, right? And then that's assuming that you know, my consciousness could even enter, like, because, you know, you can think like, oh, well, that doesn't even make sense. 
for my consciousness to enter into your body because your body produces your consciousness. So like if my consciousness were in your body, it would just be your consciousness. Like, you know, like there's basically only exactly identically only one consciousness that can arise from Joshua Rasmussen's current physical state. Yeah. And whatever that is, it's either present or it's not present. Like either you're alive in your current physical configuration or you're not right. And then whatever is animating Joshua Rasmussen's physical presence right now, like that produces the Joshua Rasmussen consciousness. And so the idea of you and I switching bodies is incoherent. Yeah. Right? On the sort of bottom up, like the, yeah. the chemicals and the, 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 all of the physical stuff produces the consciousness. You can't have that kind of two way causal interaction where as we were talking about like focusing and, and, and practicing imagery in your mind to affect your brain, that that imagery in your mind is just another part of your brain affecting another part of the brain. Then in that case, we couldn't really switch bodies. You yeah, couldn't put because, your consciousness into my body. Yeah. Because then it's like, cause you, I think that for most people, they can imagine that their sense of themselves could change into a different form. Like, they could move into a different form. Like, I don't know if anybody else has had dreams where they would be a different form. Like I remember like my sister saying that she had a dream where she was like in a cat body, you know? Or like, I think my daughter said that she had this dream that she was like some sort of a bird or something, you know? And then it's like, okay, like if you're talking and, and thinking, you know, if you're, if you have your personality and, and whatever it is, you close your eyes and you reflect upon that, that perspective, it's like, you can imagine that perspective being inside a different form. And like, that would explain why there would be such a movie as like Freaky Friday, because it seems like it's within the human consciousness to imagine such a reality where you could actually switch um, a physical form, but maintain a psychological form, right? Um, and so like, you can ask like, how that could be possible. And, you know, it's interesting because there's, um, a lot of, uh, study about this around, um, you know, in the, in Russia, in, in the Ukraine and then, um, the, you know, Czech Republic, like in that area, uh, of the world, there's a lot of scientists. It's, it's not as woo woo over there. And so they actually do a lot of studies on, uh, what they call the, um, bioluminescence, the, the um, bioelectric field that they can actually measure, like they can actually do these things where they measure, you, you put your um, finger on uh, some sort of a scanner and then it, um, they measure a, a spectrum of photons coming off of your finger and they measure the intensity and the wavelength of the photons coming off in different directions. And then they can actually, they've actually correlated the different directions of the photons to different regions of the body and they can determine whether there's certain organ systems in your body that are struggling by the intensity of the photons that are coming off of your finger uh, photon field that's being emitted from your finger and i mean there's lots of other like, I, I know that there are people who like, they study your iris. They like look at your iris to see patterns. Like they can see if you have some problem in your body, depending on the um, pattern of your iris. Mm -hmm. And like, um, and I think that they even do the, the thing for your, like your whole body, like they can determine, they can actually measure with the right um, equipment, with the right, um, you know, you have to, you have to measure the right sort of uh, fields, but you can actually measure if there's a, the field, if it has a certain weakness or something in, in your field that then it's correlated. They, they found correlations between certain areas of the field and then certain body systems. And so then they've, um, actually developed this other method of trying to diagnose, um, underlying issues like health issues. And so like, if you think about that, then it's like, oh, okay, well, what if your consciousness is actually um, more along the line of uh, an energetic field? You know, it's like a localized energetic field 
And then that energetic field comes and in the same way, like if you put a, uh, you know, if you, if you put some copper plates in the midst of some, you know, uh, some electrons just around in, in some sort of a, um, a vacuum tube or something. It's like you can turn on that, um, that electric potential, create a voltage between those plates, and then you can actually cause those electrons to move toward one of the plates. Like you can actually do that. Or, or if you have, um, you know, alpha particles or you have, if you have different types of particles, you have like free protons just floating through the air. You can, you can cause them to move according to these things that are highly known, which are called field lines. You know, you can do that even just sprinkling magnet, um, you know, like iron filings over a piece of glass or something, and then put a magnet underneath. And then the filings will create this nice, beautiful pattern. And that's because they're aligning themselves to um, this invisible thing called a field, right? And then it's like, oh, like, well, well what is that invisible thing, you know? And then you, you talk about like religious people, they're saying, oh, the spirit is something invisible. It's invisible, right? And it's like, oh, well, what if the quote spiritual things are just being talked about in a different way in the spiritual community and in the scientific community? In the scientific community, we say, oh, there's this thing called a field. You know, it's invisible. We can't see yeah. it. We don't even know like, <laughs> like what it is really. <laughs> but you know, it's perfectly, it's perfectly scientific. We're measuring it. It's you know, it's, it's physical. It's definitely physical. And right? if it's physical, then it's okay. If it's physical, if it's then, -physical it's okay, right? then that's so, spooky. That's woo. We can't have that. Yeah. 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 So but then what you're saying is that it, you're kind of describing the same thing with different terms is, is I think. Hey, what yeah. And then it's like, okay, well, cause then that's what I'm saying. It's like, okay, you start to have like such a hard distinction between what's physical and what's spiritual. Well, like, at a certain point, you, you start to see more things so that those distinctions become more weird. Like, like how can I even make a distinction? Like, for example, like if I'm saying like, oh, you're, you, Josh, are a soul. Like you are fundamentally a soul. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that even mean? Right. Like, I, I feel like it starts to get I'm me. hard. I'm me. That's what I am. But what is that? What is the Yeah, what is that? What is right? the meanness there? Yeah. Because um, you can talk about it in terms of like, the, the way that I, I am thinking about it is that there's something that is um, almost like identity first. It's like, there's the you, the subjective I that comes first. And then out from that is the manifestation, right? So whether you describe that in terms of a soul, a spirit, or an energetic field, right? It's like, Josh primarily is the center of consciousness that the subjective I that has this particular type of field that causes, you know, atoms to arrange themselves in a particular way when they're interacting with this field, right? I mean, because then well, that's- So Rachel, very... Rachel, remember when you had that energy experience? Yeah. When you were sort of, see, you were thinking a lot about healing and you got this energy experience. And what was interesting was that um, I wanted to see if you could transfer that energy to me. And so I held your hand and I don't know what you did. Do you remember? It was like, you held my hand. Were you like intending to give me energy? I just remember I, I was like in this receiving mode, mode. Like I want to receive your energy because you had used this to heal somebody uh, and you would use this and, and you, so, so I wanted to receive that. And then I remember feeling tingles in my fingers. And for me, it was all like an experiment. Like I wanted to know, like, hey, what is this? As soon as I felt the tingles, then it was like, okay, that's interesting. And then what I noticed was that later um, I was thinking about somebody, one of my friends from childhood, and he had a disease and he was coming to the end of his life. And I felt this compassion. And then I noticed that as I felt that compassion, I also felt that same tingling sensation in my fingers. It was like, there was this connection between the compassion and then the, that tingling sensation. And I'm wondering if that connects up with what you're saying here about the energy fields, because, okay, th this is one of the fascinating topics is the way in which something can be described in one culture 
and then it can be translated into another culture and you're kind of referring to the same thing, but you just don't know it because the terms are different. And um, I mean, the next part of this story was that we, uh, there was somebody that we knew that we um, prayed for them. And I remember feeling that same energy on my fingertips. And uh, after we prayed for them, it was praying for their back. And they said that the, the pain that they were feeling in their back was gone. And um, so I was thinking, you know, that might be placebo or coincidence or something. Well, and they had had some serious back issues, like for years, surgeries and things. Yeah. And then they went to the doctors and, and she called me up on the phone and, and said uh, she was in tears because the, the x-rays came back, the back was, was good. Um, and she was in tears because she said she could carry her grandkids for the first time in years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even to this day, I think about that and I think, okay, one could explain that event in different ways. One, one could give a completely physicalistic explanation of that event. And I'm okay with that, right? Because however you describe that, it was connected to consciousness. There was something that you and I did in our consciousness and in our intention. There was a feeling of an energy release. And then her pain was, was, um, went away. And it seemed like there was a physical effect. And the idea that consciousness can't have a physical effect seems to go against. Well, it's interesting experience. because yeah. the way that you're talking about it makes it seem like there was these like remote, uh, you know, events that happened for you like a long time ago, like, like a few times, you know, like, oh, you felt this thing in your fingertips. It's like, it makes it sound so like, oh, when like so weird. Time, I don't know. So what, like, what? I mean, um, from my perspective is just, kind of different, a different sort of experience. So like, um, I mean, I remember before I had any belief system about anything being, you know, a young child, like in my bunk bed, in my room sharing, like I'm on the top bunk and my sister's on the bottom bunk. And it's like in, in the middle of the night sometime. And so I don't know how old I am exactly, but you know, grade school, like second, third grade, maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe first grade. <laughs> and then um, I'm just laying in my bunk bed in the dark. And I have this um, very vivid sensation of something that in my current, because I, at the time I had no terminology to use. And so I had this feeling like I wanted to ask somebody about it, but I didn't know how to express myself. And so I didn't know how to ask anybody about it. And so I just never talked about it. And I never heard anybody use any terminology that would help me to express what I was experiencing. And so um, for that reason, I just never talked about it for years. Like probably until I, like when I was um, 26 years old, then that was when I was like, okay, I just wanna like kind of just know what's true and not just have the paradigm that I was raised in and I just want to like see things for as they, as they are. And so I felt like that was in a sense, like a spiritual awakening for me, <laughs> um, if you call it that. Um, but anyway, so uh, when I was like, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I don't know how old I was, but I just remember having this very vivid experience of um, what I'll call um, basically an energy field. And I had the explicit feeling of where it was going how quickly it was going and how far it was extending from myself. So it was kind of coming up, kind of like out from my head, coming about like maybe like, you know, maybe less than a foot away from my head and coming about maybe like a foot in front of me and coming down. And then it was coming right back to my center, like right kind of to my stomach area. And then it came right back up and then it came right out and it was kind of going at this rate. So it was kind of, you know, like kind of at this sort of a gentle flow rate. And I would notice occasionally, if I ever got startled, I would notice this feeling of the way that I'll say it is that my energy jumped back into myself. So it like, it reversed order and it went very quickly and it like, and it caused me to like shrink or like feel like, like that. And it felt like all my energy got stopped. 
And that's interesting that you described the energy as coming out this way, like that. Yeah. It, it was going up. It wasn't it was going up. It wasn't and it was coming way. down. And, yeah. and then it was coming back up and it was coming up and it was coming down. And um and so the other thing that I was uh noticing is that it would take a while for my energy to kind of like restore back to that normal um, flow after I got startled or like afraid of something, like it would feel like all my energy got stuck. And then it's like, okay, like it's almost like slowly, maybe I would feel like there's being something like it's trying to like move again, but it's almost like, you know, if you rustle up, you know, like if you have a water fountain and then you like shake it, it's almost like it at first isn't, it's kind of like going different directions or something. And it's like, not, and then it's like, finally, okay. Like now it's back into its normal flow or, or, or something like that. And it would take, you know, a while, you know, probably take like a minute or something to get that back into its normal flow. And, um, that would be this experience that I would have that, um, I didn't have any terminology for it. And, um, so I was raised in a church denomination that, uh, did not believe like anything, anything that would be like spiritual would be like demonic. Like that's bad. Don't even think about that. That's the occult, you know? Um, and so because of that, like, I didn't really even have any frame for understanding even just what I was sensing because, um, well, then when you went to, uh, into the Notre Dame, uh, science program, I don't, I don't think they had a, a conceptual frame for that either. No. Mm-mm. Right. I mean, they talked about fields, right. But not energy. Well, I wasn't, um, I wasn't in, in a program that was talking about, um, neuroscience or consciousness yeah. or anything. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't talking about those things in my science degree, but, um, yeah, I mean, the scientists that I knew in my program were not thinking along those lines at all um and it's funny because i'll even just throw in the fact that it's like well basically when you are going into the science field you're taught things again like from the frame of authority you're taught things and then um you know you just take like you're graded on them you know you have to you have to do these equations and then you have to, you know, recount these facts. And then you have to like, you know, you have to like, basically you have to show that, you know, all these facts. Right. And and this is how all of the schooling is. Right. But when you are being raised as a scientist, like it's the same thing. Right. And um, I just remember being taught very authoritatively that, you know, the Mickelson Morley experiment um, showed that there was no ether. And, um, and it's just interesting because, um, I believe that there were experiments done, I think it was in the eighties, but I don't know. Um, I can't remember exactly the citation, but I think that, um, those findings were reversed. Like they, they were like, oh yeah, we found, we found, um, the universal field or whatever, you know, you can't call it the ether anymore. Right. But, um, but they're like, oh yeah, we found the universal field and we know about that, but you're never taught that like the, the um, science that you're taught in the education system is um, I think very stagnant and you're just taught these things that are like just passed down through authority. And so all the students, like they don't have primary, not primary knowledge. It's not like they've done an experiment to see like whether photons going in one direction or another direction, come back to a detector at the same time or not. Like they, they don't know that like, they haven't done that experiment. Um, but it's just interesting how, you know, then all the scientists would say very confidently, oh, well, the science says that this, right? Or, oh, like we know that this. And it's just interesting because, um, and, and I was, um, you know, in a class one time and the instructor said, when it comes to quantum physics. And I think we were doing, um, some sort of calculations. It had to do with like solid state physics, something like that. And, um, you have to do some calculations to figure out how to, uh, calculate how the electrons move through a crystal or something like this. 
And basically he said something along the lines of, you know, uh, these calculations are not intuitive or like the, the, um, the way that this is like appearing or the way it works itself out, like is not intuitive, but you get used to it. Right. And, um, and I just remember pondering that like, oh, it's not intuitive, but you just get used to it. And I remember having those same thoughts, like that's what people would say about the theory of relativity. Oh, it's not intuitive, but you know, you get used to it. Like it works out, the, the equations work out, you know? And I, I just would have this feeling like whenever somebody was saying that, that meant that there was something they didn't understand. <clears throat> because I think that um, at least this is just my, my instinct, which is that if you really understand reality, if you're really seeing it to the core, to the foundation, then you would actually find it intuitive. And that's just, you know, that's just my own personal intuition. I just have that belief. And so it's intuitive that reality would be intuitive. Yeah. And so, and so because of that, like whenever somebody's saying, oh, well, you just have to believe this and the science shows this. Yes, Lonnie, you can have that. <laughs> and the science shows this, and this doesn't really make any sense, but you just have to believe it anyway. Right. It's like, to me, I feel like, um, I don't really like that because that feels like bullying. It's a science stopper. Maybe. Well, especially it's when you find out stopper. the studies yeah. that, give another account of the data. They're empirically equivalent. They, yeah. they account for the data. Um, and you might well, not have heard of those other theories. I think that's what you kind of told me is that there are all these things that you heard and learned, and then you did more science. You went further into the field and you discovered, oh, there's actually these other studies. How come I didn't know about these studies? There's other data, there's other interpretations of the data. And that wasn't part of the, the program originally. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't part of it. and. The other thing that wasn't part of it was the idea that you can interpret um, different things in different ways. And that was where, um, when I encountered, you know, before I met you and the other people at Notre Dame, I never even heard of philosophy before. I didn't know we what were philosophy talking about was. The philosophy of physics. Remember that? Yeah. And Rachel, then Rachel, I we remember have first, we have our first question from the audience. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I just remember I just remember being so confused by the fact that there were philosophers who were not scientists talking about the theory of relativity and they were giving all these alternative explanations of how that works out like in the metaphysics and I was just like what like there's other interpretations and then it was so weird because the philosophers were basically coming up with some similar ideas that I was having I was like it seems like the scientists are saying that the length is contracting when you go at a certain speed. And I'm like, that does not make sense to me. That does not seem intuitive. That doesn't seem to get at the root of it. And then like the philosophers were, you know, having different interpretations. And it's like, oh, actually, some of these ideas that the philosophers are coming up with actually are kind of matching some of the ideas that I was coming up with. And and I was like, oh, there's people who do this for a living. And, and I was like, oh, this is very intriguing. And so then I got addicted to philosophy ever since then. Well, you wanted to understand like the reality of things, not just a set of equations. Oh, I remember asking my advisor, what is a photon? Yeah, we and, had over. We had yeah, over. We her and her husband, like, they're, yeah. they're both in um, you know physics, like electrical engineering and physics and, you know, like, and they're like explaining that photons are wave packets. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me because what is a wave? Like what's waving? A wave implies that something's waving. <laughs> it was like, it's like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, like, I don't know. It's just, so it's interesting. Okay, the philosophers well, go at things a little differently than the scientists say. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think there can be a, a harmonious, um, joint effort where we can lean on e each other's strengths, but I'm, I'm getting excited over here. This is, this is our first mornings with Josh and Rachel, and we have our first uh, comments here and questions. So I'm going to send this over to the scientists. This comes from finding truth. Okay, Rachel, are you ready for this? Maybe not. We'll the whole out. world is watching. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, what if a materialist says that the reason why prayer or an event like you described, praying for a friend, was just some sort of Darwinian mechanism activated because of some psychological need or for self-preservation? So that's a great question. So that um, there's a Darwinian mechanism activated. So that is interesting because um, I guess that to me, I would have to just know what you mean by a Darwinian mechanism because that's not very specific. Like you're using someone's name and then you're using this term mechanism. So like, for example, I uh, propose the theory that here's a, a mechanism of transferring um, a conscious experience to someone, which is that I, my consciousness creates a field that then transfers photons or energy or, or something. It does something that interacts with your uh, field and then it, it's actually making some change. And so like that's, that's a proposed mechanism. So it's a proposed mechanism based on fields or like photons or energy or whatever. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm not studying this. I'm, there are people who are studying these sorts of things. A lot of these things end up being classified. Uh, a lot of these things will um, be, you know, written in Russian because they're not um, translated into English. They're not accessible in our country. But um, there are people who study this, like for their career, like there are people who have actually made um, strides forward in this sort of a field. So I'm not gonna claim to have the expertise on this, but um, I guess uh, I would suggest um, that if there's a materialist, that um, that would be great. Like, you know, okay, like propose a theory, like, okay, what is the mechanism? And then we can, you know, have the question of whether it's consistent with Darwin's philosophy or not. And just a little um, quick side note on Darwin. It's interesting because um, you talk about there were a lot of different competing theories about the history of the world and, and mechanisms that were going on in terms of how creatures interact with one another and where life came from. And Darwin proposed some interesting propositions, some interesting premises that then um, you find out through the politics of the hierarchy of science end up being selected as the ones that uh, get um, pushed forward into the next generation of um, scientific argument. Because um, there were others who were also presenting theories as well. Um, you also find out interesting things like that Darwin was in the line of like Freemasons and things like that. So that like gets into weird stuff if you wanna go down that trail. But it's interesting because uh, the whole framework that Dar Darwin is under is that there is um, no overarching principle of maybe like a loving or compassionate um, consciousness or entity like a God or, or some sort of a source of mind. Um, like, I think that, you know, you talk with like Buddhists and they'll say like the foundation of everything is um, compassion. You know, what's the underlying fabric of everything? It's compassion. You know, you talk with Christians, they say, what's the foundation of everything? It's um, God is love, you know? So basically what Darwin's theory presupposes is that there is no underlying fabric of love or compassion. It's all just blank. Like it's all just, if, you know, if, you add, if you add that philosophy to it. I mean, I, I was actually thinking, Rachel, that um, when I read The Origin of Species, oh. it's Jonah. Hey, Jonah, listen to this. We're talking about how everything came to be. No, we're talking about consciousness and its powers. Um, I was actually thinking that it would be consistent with a certain uh, interpretation of the mechanisms that... Oh, just a second. Hey, Lana. Lana, will you give Jonah a Well, my, my conversation partner is uh, distracted. It's great to see you guys here. Um, Jonah wants a muffin. Hold on. Lana, will you give Jonah a muffin? He got so sad. He saw that the muffins were not in their 
So, um, yeah, he thought they were all. I have just a couple questions I wanted to share on this. Do you want to eat the muffin in my? Um, in my I'll wait for Rachel to come back. Okay. Rachel. Here. It's not hot. Say thank you, Lana. So, Rachel, do you remember when you were sitting in that chair behind you? And I was feeling kind of emotionally connected to my heart. Yeah. And I said to you, I said um, that I, I had this feeling like there was an energy field that was coming from my heart down underneath and coming up to you. And then it came from you to me. But before yeah. I told you that, I asked you, mm -hmm. uh, what I said was that it feels like there's an energy field. And I asked you, which you direction about that, which direction. Mm -hmm. and, and then you said you felt like, you had energy coming this way. Yep. Yeah. That was consistent with what out I was out from me, out and up from me, over to you, and then down and under from you coming to me. And yeah. then I was um, noticed, and, and I said, definitely, definitely. We both had that same feeling independently. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, go and, ahead. Um, there was another time when um, I felt like it was the opposite direction that you, you the energy field was coming I remember that. out and up from you and it was yes. coming over to me and then down and under from me and going to you. And um, I think it might have to do with the uh, direction of impartation, like yeah. who is sort of- It felt that way. Yeah, and yeah. it felt like I was, I, like you were kind of imparting, I was sort of supporting. It, it just felt that way intuitively. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, I, I really want to just say this to, to the question, which is that, uh, that that power, if there is such a power of consciousness, um, could, could come in different from different mechanisms, right? So it could be that um, this is part of survival of the fittest. Like the reason that we have this, this power of consciousness is because it contributes to our survival. And that's, that's consistent with even what you were describing in terms of the fabric of the universe having compassion at its foundation. Well, basically what I would say is there's no competition, like no competition, like, okay, fine. Like it's a Darwinistic mechanism or, you know, the materialist can say whatever. Okay, fine. Like, that's great. But, you know, what's the theory? I mean, basically, it comes down to what's the theory. Because... Um, Do we have this power? Do we actually have this power? Basically, either there is a power or there's not. And um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, as long as it's real, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's kind of like what we we're talking about earlier. Like, what is really the difference between material and spiritual? I mean... At this point, it becomes um, ambiguous to me, even what the distinction is. Mm -hmm. And then it goes, instead of a distinction between, oh, like, I'm a naturalist. I don't believe in anything spiritual. You know, that's woo-woo, right? <laughs> and then, oh, I'm spiritual. I believe everything is comes spiritual. from the spirit. And there's and nothing natural is. about it. It's all supernatural, right? It's like, okay, people can use these terminologies. But in the end, like, what are they really saying? And then given that we're all living in some sort of a similar reality, then um, we can use different descriptive words to talk about a similar experience, but either the experience is similar, either that's a real experience or it's not. And even what do you mean by real? I mean, that's another discussion, but let's just take that, you know, your perception is at least real. So if I perceive that when you come close to me and then you do something, and then that activates within me some mechanism that causes me to be feeling better. It's like, okay, well, that could just be, you know, survival of the fittest sort of like social mechanism that, you know, some sort of like, you know, scientists talk about placebo effect or something, you know, it could just be something, right, that's activated. But then you have to say, okay, well, that's an interpretive lens, right? That's an interpretive lens. You're saying that this is a survival of the fittest mechanism. That's an interpretation. But what are you actually talking about? What was that that yeah. you were calling a survival of the fittest mechanism? Right. So what happened? Was it that your um, your atoms, you know, had a chemical reaction with my atoms? Well, probably not. It doesn't seem like that's likely. Was there some sort of an electrical current? It's like, I don't know. Was there some exchange of photons or some exchange of a field or some sort of interaction like you know you just have to just start to spell it out like what is it and then when you actually spell it out like what it is then you start to just see that 
it doesn't really matter what your interpretive lens is, whether it's a Darwinian mechanism. That's just actually, I think um, we try to like categorize things into labels to make things easier to understand. But I think that it, it can too easily, um, it can too easily signal tribes. It's like, like here's the tribal aspect. Like I'm gonna signal that my authority figure is Darwin and you know, someone else is gonna say, oh, I believe that um, your chakras are out of balance. And then it's like, oh, okay, well that signals, they have a certain authority structure that, that you know, uses the system of chakras, you know? So, and then it's like, okay, well, that can either create division or can create um, a starting point for having a conversation to see whether those um, experiences that those different tribes of people are having are in any way overlapping. And I think that that's where it becomes the most interesting because yeah. then you're actually trying to get at what it really is. What is really true. And because sometimes the authorities can sort of create an interpretive lens and you know, and I would even distinguish between like whether something exists, like whether there is a sort of consciousness or this energy sort of, I think kind of what we're talking about is maybe this conscious power that can have an effect even on physical systems, whether locally or remotely, at least that's one of the things that we're talking about. And I just remember Rachel, when you had that experience with feeling that energy and then I touched your hand and there was this transfer of energy. Um, and then we had more than one experience of, of praying for someone and feeling that energy transfer. I remember- well, and, and you have your you have your experience and you're talking a lot about my experience, but- um, <laughs> Ours isn't necessarily the same, but I, I remember just thinking, okay, there are two questions. What it, uh, whether this is real and then what explains it? And I remember going from thinking, being skeptical whether there was such a thing to thinking, okay, I've experienced firsthand. There is this kind of energy and it can have these effects. Okay. Talk about that for a second. Jonah spitting banana bread muffin all over me. Just a second. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, my wife had this experience with, with um, feeling tingles in her hands. And then it seemed like I was able to experience that energy from her. And I just remember thinking, okay, there really is this thing that I'm experiencing. And there's different ways of explaining what that is and where that comes from, or even why that is, why that exists. Um, but that there is this experience, that this experience can actually have a physical effect and even heal, cause healing in bodies. Since then, then I saw a whole bunch of scientific studies um, about that. And, and again, this can be interpreted in different ways or different metaphysical frames that will account for that. So, okay, cool. So I see somebody was asking about why my wife's degree. She got a, a master's in uh, physical chemistry at Notre Dame when I was there. And uh, so I think what I'm going to do here is have a look at some of these questions here and just read them. And then if Rachel comes back, we'll probably wrap this up. Uh, this is kind of a, a cool little experiment. We've been, we've been wanting to do this mornings with Josh and Rachel for a while because we'll have these conversations with each other and they're just so much fun. And oftentimes I would think it'd be interesting just to get this on camera. And so here we go. Here's our experiment. All right, Kyle. What if the simplest and most parsimonious interpretation of some scientific theory is counterintuitive? Should we go with the less parsimonious view to save intuition or get rid of the intuition. And here, I mean, the way that I sort of think about it is I wanna work with all of the data that I have. Uh, intuition is, is a bit of data. Uh, intuition, some people say, well, intuition is very, well, it's unreliable. It seems to me that intuition is the basis of logic. So the way that I can sort of discern that there are no contradictions, for example. So contradictions are counterintuitive. They go against intuition. But then I've heard people say that, oh, well, there's some studies in quantum mechanics that maybe suggest that there could be contradictions. Well, let me look at those studies, see how to interpret them. Um, but hey, in principle, if there's empirical evidence that goes against some intuition, then the empirical evidence, if it's weightier in my mind, that could be a reason to overturn the, the intuition. So I, I don't think there's really an easy answer 
in, in terms of that, because I think that I want to look at all of the different data points that I have and try to come up with an account of them. Yes, in the simplest way, but the whole question is, what are my data points? I think if I restrict myself to data points only through the senses of, of observation, then I'll be limiting the data that I have at my disposal. Welcome back. I don't, I don't really know what you were talking about, but you were um, sparking an idea. Yeah, go for it. And, and I was um, thinking um, maybe we could wrap it up uh, if you want to, but I mean, I don't want to cut you off here, but yeah, no, that'd that's be your fine. idea. Yep. Um, well, it's interesting because you can talk about um, something and someone will naturally be skeptical of something if they don't have any experience with that thing. Or if a certain experience has been interpreted um, in a certain way based upon a certain authority structure. Um, I mean, so for example, like when we were talking with like the Jehovah's Witnesses, it seemed like we could have arguments with them about what certain things mean, but it seemed like we couldn't really make progress because they actually weren't thinking for themselves and evaluating what their belief was. They were in the position of defending the authority that yep. they had come under and finding more reasons to defend that authority. So I think that atheists sometimes will notice that certain theists, especially when they are Christian, because it seems like the atheists like to debate the Christians for whatever reason, um, that they tend to uh, discover that the Christians would come under an authority, a Christian authority, and then that <clears throat> it would seem like they would be arguing about whatever their view was, not evaluating whether their view was true, but arguing why their view was true the in defense yeah. of what their authority yeah. said was true, right? And so um, I think that the same thing can happen um, when we're defending a political view, when we're defending a scientific view, when we're defending any sorts of numbers of views um, that come under different types of categories. Um, and that we can actually, without even really realizing it, we can be defending a view that was passed down to us through an authority structure. Um, and we're not actually evaluating whether our view is true. We're actually just finding reasons to defend the view that we have. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad. I think that it's, um, it's just something to be aware, aware of. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you might think it's true because of that authority, but you might not know that it's because of that authority that you think it's true. So this is what I would find a lot is that um, there would be some kind of authority that's in a sense thinking for somebody else. And then that somebody else, if you ask them why they have their beliefs, they will give reasons. But then if you interact with their reasons and maybe show that there's problem, problems with their reasons, if they continue to have that belief, it could be that, you know, it's difficult always to know what our reasons are, but sometimes I've definitely noticed this. Um, I think we can all relate to this, that there's somebody who has kind of an authority on our, our on our mind. It's, it's like that authority is actually operating with greater strength than the reasons themselves. And, um, and I think that's what you're kind of getting to. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just interesting because um, I think that that can be a good starting point for having a conversation. But then at some point, what's the matter? I guess there's something about this muffin he doesn't like. Are you having trouble with that muffin? You don't like it? Yes. Okay. Here. I, I think, um, here. Here, here, do you want to spit it out? Here, here, here. All right, we're going to just wrap this up. You guys, it's so great to see you here. Um, thank you for joining us. This has been a blast. This is our, our, our first episode, a random conversation. We talked about consciousness, authority, beliefs. And uh, we look forward to having another connection time with you guys. So thank you for joining us. And 